As you, uh, Andrew mentioned, my name is Luis Perez. I'm a biology major. Um, and today I'll talk to you guys about my research. So just to get started, um, I'm, I'm a beekeeper in my free time. So this was the reason why I decided to work with honeybees for my research project. Um, I thought about what problems have I had as a beekeeper that I would like to research for myself and also research so that others might benefit from it. So uh, I came up with the question of, can different breeds of honeybees better survive burrow mites? So what are honeybees? So honeybees, are, most people know about honeybees is that they are small flying insect that makes honey. Um, but we have to expand a little bit on this. So the honeybees that we are used to seeing are descendants from the European honeybee, uh, Apis mellifera. They have since been bred to create different breeds, each with different genetic uh, traits. The most common breeds are Italian, Russian, Caucasian, African, and feral or wild bees. Uh, these are the honeybees that most people use, most beekeepers use now. Um, so, and then what are, so some of the characteristics of, that beekeepers look for when choosing breeds are how much honey they store, how big the colony can get, without swarming, how well they survive in colder weather, or and even how defensive they are um, when being manipulated. Um, this is the reason why African honeybees are well known um, in our area, um, because they're not favored amongst beekeepers. They are very defensive. So each breed uh, ranks differently in these and other characteristics. So where does the varroa mite come in? The varroa mite is a honeybee predator. They are the natural predators for the Asian hive bee, uh, which is a distant cousin of the um, honeybees that we see here. They're, they're from Asia, obviously. And they're able to coexist with the honeybees, with the Asian honeybee, but they are not able to coexist with the bees that we're used to because they haven't created that biological uh, mutation, I guess, over, over the years. So that's why they are referred to as the varroa destructor um, in our in our area. Um, varroa mites are accounted for; they accounted for thirty percent of colony colony loss in the U.S. just last year. So, just to expand a little bit on the varroa mite itself, uh, the varroa mite is a very small tick-like insect that attaches to the body of a newborn developing honeybee and it grows along with the developing bee as it, as it feeds. Uh, as you can see in the image here, um, it's, it shows the stages of the mite. So when the queen bee um, lays an egg, the male and female will go into the egg cell and reproduce. The mite cell, the mite egg will be laid on the developing honeybee where it will grow and later repeat the cycle. The major problem with the mite is how they affect the, the developing bee. They take important lipids needed for full development of the honeybee. This can lead to weak immunity against viruses like the foreign wing virus, acute bee paralysis virus, black queen cell virus, and sac root viruses. These are all viruses that will um, lead to colony, lo colony loss. So no immunity towards these viruses ultimately leads to colony loss. Even after treatment for the mite, the colony can be infected with one of these viruses and not have enough numbers to survive. Sorry, I'm trying to move forward here. So here's a, here's a, my um, slide, which, which shows the different types of honeybees, um, breeds that us beekeepers use today. As you can see, the African buckfest, uh, carnolian, Caucasian, these are all the bees that beekeepers are using around the world. Um, and it varies 
between each beekeeper which one they like to keep most um, just based on their traits. As you can see at the bottom, the varroa resistance is um, listed as um, being the, the highest for African and the lowest for you know a couple of the other ones. So my question was whether some breeds are able to survive after the mite treatment better than other breeds. So not having access to all the different breeds, I could not do a hands-on experiments, but knowing that there's a lot of organizations and there's a lot of beekeepers around and I could get in contact with them, I wanted to maybe have them help me gather the, the data that I needed um, based on their experiences with their with their honeybees so my objective was to create a survey to distribute to beekeepers around the world where they could answer questions about their colonies and they and i would then use that information to create uh results so i created the survey asking beekeepers about the breeds they use in their apiary in, in their apiary the breed of the infected hives they had with varroa and how many of each hive they had. So I collected, uh, I collected my, my results um, for the infected hives. We can see that, that the most infected were Italian um, with about 15 hives. Um, feral was next or wild. Feral is the same as wild type. Um, they had an 11 about 11 hives were infected. Russian had about seven and Caucasian had the least at six. Um, my next question was what kind of treatment they used. 50% um, of the responses that I got was saying that they use oxalic acid uh, as a form of treatment that beekeepers use where it, it's inserted into the, into the hive. It doesn't harm these, it just, um, it just gets like vaporized and it kills the mites, but the bees don't get affected by it. 17% use formic acid and 33% use another form of, of treatment. Uh, this can vary between mitoways and strips and some other treatments that people use. Uh, my next question was survival. So off of the, of the hives that were infected, I, need, I wanted to see how many hives of each breed survived. And we can see that um, 12 of the Italian hives survive. Um, eight of the Russian survived, none of the Caucasian uh, hives survived, and nine of the feral or wild type hives survived. Uh, so then that gave me the, um, that gave me the, uh, the result of creating a verse, an infective versus survival rate. Here we can see that the feral and Italian bees both share a 37% survival rate, whereas uh, Caucasian would have had a 0% survival rate since none of them survived, and the Russians showed a 26% survival rate. I also wanted to ask the season that these beekeepers are um, testing and treating for varroa because the varroa mite tends to um, infect hives in the winter time when the, the temperatures get colder, the bees don't go out. And that's when they, the varroa mite tends to go in there and attack or infect the hive and reproduce at a rapid rate. So that when spring comes around and the bees start to go out of their hives, they, there's, that's when beekeepers really see the infestation. So I wanted to see what season beekeepers were do, using to test and uh, treat for varroa. And you can see that the fall is the perfect season to, to start treating for varroa as is before the winter. So you can, you can kind of have a prevention against the mite. Um, the other seasons were kind of split evenly be, between, the, between themselves. So lastly, I wanted to, um, I just wanted to be able to understand which breeds are better survivors against the varroa mite. Um, and that can, and I can use that information to give beekeepers um, just kind of general information and kind of fill them up with, with better information on 
um, having less risk of losing colonies. Um, and I know that a lot of beekeepers, from a, from personal experience, I know a lot of beekeepers lose interest in beekeeping when they lose their their hives within the first year due to varroa. I mean, it's a normal process. We all have to deal with it. But I wanted to be able to help them pick a better breed that might be able to have a higher chance of survival in terms of you know getting infected and being treated. Just being able to also you know survive even even after treatment. Um. So I would I, I wanted to use the knowledge that I gained from the from my research to help other beekeepers understand that. Um, and this is uh, this is actually a, just a quick picture of me with my with my hives in my house uh, here in the Cape. I don't you know, we're allowed to have bees. If anybody's interested, you can contact me and we can we can get you started. There's a couple of students out of GCU that that are beekeepers uh, along myself and some professors too. So. You guys have questions you guys can ask me and um, we can talk that's it all right thank you lewis that was really interesting what uh, what questions from the audience for lewis one question in the chat how do you test for varroa there's different forms of testing. Um, the best way to test for varroa mite, even though it seems very difficult because they are very small, is to just keep an eye on your hives. You know, I go out and just look at them. If if um, you, you see me pull, like, like right, you see in the picture here, I'm pulling out a frame. You just kind of scan the bees, and once you get the hang of it, you kind of, you see for the, for the mite, you can see them. They're like, they're a real, real little red spot that just kind of, Kind of like a tick, um, just kind of walking on the bee, and you 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 definitely see them. Um, most people use just that treatment or, or just that form of uh, checking, or some people use a a um, what's called a sugar roll. Um, they put some bees in a um, in like a glass jar with sugar, and the mite will get off the bee, and you can see them on the sugar itself. Thanks. Uh, another question in the chat. Uh, what did you want to get out of doing this research? So the main thing I wanted to get out of was I wanted to see which breed was better in terms of surviving the high, the, the varroa after treatment, because even after treatment, the colony might be low enough in numbers um, that even though you were able to completely get the varroa off of them, um, their numbers might be might be might not be high enough to survive like a winter, um, and you know you lose the colony overall because of Aurora because of the other implementations it has. Thanks. Okay, two more questions in the chat. The next one is: How far into the future will you continue to work with bees? Uh, so right now, um, I've actually lost which helped me for the research, but I've actually lost three of the hive of the four hives pictured in the, uh, in the picture. I, I've lost three of them to Varroa for this winter time so far. Um, so I'm working to get more bees. Um, I have one strong hive and in terms of how long, uh, I mean, I like it, it's fun. It's, it's a hobby, it gets me out of the house and um, working with, with animals and the environment. I think it's, I think it's fun. I don't know if that answers that question in a way. For sure, yeah, it sounds really cool. This is something I don't know much about. Uh, next question in the chat says, uh, really cool work. Um, I realize Africanized honeybees aren't necessarily good for typical beekeeping, but why do you think the uh, African bees are so resistant to the Varroa mites compared to the other breeds? So bees overall use, um, or for for the for the Asian bee, which is the varroa mites, um, natural like coexisting um, species, yeah. they actually they actually go ahead and treat themselves for the varroa. So bees will kind of in a like a they have a behavior where they check their, their they check the the other bees in the hive, and if they see the varroa, they'll take that bee out and actually take the varroa mite away from it. So 
African bees in their defensive mechanism, I would assume, I mean, it's a, a, probably a good, a good form of research, but um, I would assume that because they're so defensive and they don't like anything getting into their hives, I would assume that they see the varroa more as a more of a predator than any other any other breed, and they will just go ahead and completely try to eradicate it from the hive itself. Interesting. Okay, another question in the chat about roughly how long it took you to collect all of this information. Um, I started collecting information at the I want, I want to say it was at the end of the spring semester last this last spring semester but it was hard uh, I want I gotta say it was definitely hard to collect information because a lot of the organizations for beekeeping are um, so even though they're nationalized they are closed because of COVID and not they're not able to um, I guess they're not able to open their wherever they're at. And uh, so I was sending out a lot of uh, emails about, you know, sending my survey to their members of the organization, and I wasn't getting a lot of feedback. So it was definitely a tough season to, to test for this because a lot of these organizations were closed. I wasn't getting a lot of feedback and it was tough. It was definitely a hard research to do sure. right now with it at least. People were out working with their bees and not uh, answering surveys, I guess. Yeah, it was tough. Cool. Uh, just a, a few more comments here in the chat. Um, a comment that uh, the idea that keeping Africanized bees um, is difficult is not entirely true. Research is being done right now, um, maybe to breed Africanized bees that are docile. So interesting, I, I didn't know that. Um, uh, a question for you, what kind of bees do you have? So which breed? Uh, you most of my, bee, yeah, no, I get it. Uh, most of my bees start out being uh, wild bees that I, you know, I get called for doing rescues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I will actually go ahead and start out with a wild hive, and then eventually you requeen. You you take the queen out that came with that hive, and you, I mean, I hate to say it, but you dispose of it, and then you put a new queen. I like to work with Italian bees though for my for my hives. They're just more docile and they're just easier to work with. Laid back Italian lifestyle, right? Yeah. Just make sure they have enough olive oil and you're good. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, corny joke. No, you're good. Any more questions? I'm sorry I'm not able to see the chat. I'm, I'm not. It's okay. Sorry. That's my job. That's my role. Um, a few more comments. Uh, Another beekeeper commenting that all his bees are hybrids. Uh, he had them tested and about 10% are Africanized. 10% of his 30 plus hives are Africanized to some extent. So interesting comment there. Yeah, here in Florida and especially where we're at in Southwest Florida, most hives are gonna have some sort of uh, Africanized um, genetic in there, in them. Um, your best bet if you want to, because eventually they'll get more aggressive with time. Um, that's just personal experience. They'll just get more and more aggressive. Hmm. Um, the best thing to do is to requeen. Um, I would wait for the beginning of uh, the springtime and requeen your 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 hive so that you can get a less. I would just get a less aggressive bee. I mean, I've worked with Africanized bees and I've worked with hybrids, and eventually they get very very aggressive and they like to sting a lot. So I would definitely requeen. Um, that's just my personal opinion, though. So a follow-up question to that, Nicole says, thanks for your presentation, very interesting and informative. And she wants to know when you uh, get rid of the wild queen and add the Italian queen, do you start to get hybrids right away? So it takes about 28 days for new, for new, um, for new um, workers to, to be born. So she'll start laying eggs right away as soon as they accept her. Um, it'll take about 28, for, for any, 28 days for new workers to, to be born, to be like matured. Uh, it'll take about, I don't know, I want to say about two, a month to two months to for the whole hive to be completely Italian by that time. Okay. Interesting. Uh, another question, and we still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to keep going here. Um, Martin would like to know how often you collect your honey if you do that. 
Um, honey collecting. There's two. There's two times in the year you want to collect honey. You want to collect at the. Um, I like to collect at the um, end of spring and right before winter time. You can collect. You just have to leave them enough honey for them to survive. Um, over the winter time, uh, the temperatures drop below. I want to say it's like. 53 degrees, bees will not go outside at all. They'll stay in their hive and they just feed off of their own honey. And technically you're taking away from their, from their, what they work for. So you got to leave them enough for them to, to go through the winter. So I, I usually take out, um, twice a year. Okay, cool. Yeah, actually, I was thinking about that because uh, just the other day when it was quite cold, I was eating lunch out on my back deck uh, in the sun, trying to warm up. And I saw what I assume is a wild honeybee come up to me and kind of check me out. Like, oh, maybe you have something good. Um, I thought, wow, it's pretty cold for this bee to be flying around. So I wondered what he or she was up to. Okay, any other questions for Lewis? Actually, Lewis, I have one question for you because, uh, so we're supposed to, the third talk is scheduled according to this for 345. So uh, I don't want to start too early in case others are going to come in from other sessions. So early on in the presentation, you mentioned um, that one of the traits that varies from breed to breed is the like threshold density or threshold size of the hive for swarming. Can you elaborate right. on that a little bit? What exactly does that mean? And what are some examples of like a small swarm size and a large swarm size. Sure, sure, sure. So the reason why I like to requeen and do Italian bees is because Italian bees can get very, very big in colony size, whereas wild honeybees or even Africanized bees, they don't like to get very big. Um, they, I, I don't know if it has to do with their behavior in terms of like protection. Um, I don't know, but for me um, and most beekeepers, they'll do Italian or Russian bees because they they allow you to just have a lot of um, of colony space. So as you if you can see in the boxes on the picture on the right, you can see that we use a uh, a bottom a bottom box and then a top box, and you can go up three, four, five, six, seven boxes high, and those boxes will have each they'll have 10 frames like the one I'm holding in the picture. So usually we leave the bottom box is called the brood box. This is the box where we leave for the queen to lay eggs and the bees will actually continue to collect honey in all any box you put above that box. So if you have a very strong colony like an Italian colony you can get them up to like seven boxes high um, they're, they're called supers. They're called the, the honey supers. That's where the honey is collected. Um, so yeah, so that's why I like to keep Italians there. They get very big in size before they decide to split off and actually, you know, start a new colony somewhere else. Um, feral bees will not let you get to two, bo two, two, uh, two boxes high. They'll let you do one and you have to split them off because they don't like to be in those big colonies. Uh, I, I, I would assume it has to do with the Florida heat. They don't like to get too hot. Mm. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I um, actually used to live close to, uh, used to live in Germany and I, we lived close to a place that had a beekeeping museum. Um, they had all of these antique uh, bee boxes that were or these ornately carved. Maybe you've seen them. A lot of them are carved in the shapes of things like people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's room to put a couple of different, uh, I guess, racks inside. And the thing that um, struck us at the museum is that the entrance to the brooding box is always in sort of the genital region of the person that's been carved. Um, I don't know if that's an association between the brooding that goes on there uh, or what, mm -hmm. but or if it's just like the right height above the ground for these to enter and exit. Yeah, that's a definitely interesting. I know for for you know most beekeepers here, we used to what's called a Langstroth hive, which is what you see on the picture. 
Mm -hmm. um, some people like to use top bars. They're just more of a like a 30 frame long, like width wise um, hive. Um, I used to have a couple Langstroths uh, or the top, top bars. I don't get a lot of, um, I never got a really good um, production from it. So I, I changed back to Langstroths. This is what I use most, mostly now. Um, cool. uh, if anybody that's, well, cause I'm not, you know, obviously I'm going to be graduating. Um, but if anybody was interested in learning more about beekeeping and all that, there's a professor that, which, you know, helped me with my, um, with my research and helps me with bees and I've helped him with bees. His name is Tim Allen. Um, he's in the Lugger, um, hall and, um, he's a business professor, but he's a beekeeper or an economics professor, but he's a beekeeper and he actually was the one that got me started on beekeeping and he's very, very knowledgeable. He has a lot of beehives over in the uh, Estero area. And um, if anybody wants to like get with him and, you know, just learn about it and maybe even get interested in starting, um, you can definitely keep bees here in Florida and um, rural areas like Cape Coral, you can have, I think, up to five hives. Um, but down there in Estero, because it's considered farmland, you can have a lot. I know he's got, you know, more than more than 20 hives for sure. So I'm not sure if anybody was interested in that. Nice. Thanks for that contact info. All right. It's just about time for us to transition to our next speaker. So thanks, Lewis, for the uh, very interesting presentation and extensive Q&A.